Have you ever wondered how the richest and wisest king approached life, wealth, and leadership? So let's dive here into Ecclesiastes chapter 8 on the Wealth and Wisdom series here on the Seven Figure Squad and see what type of nuggets and gems that King Solomon has in terms of covering your aspirations to becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire. So earlier this week, just these last couple weeks, you've heard these and seen these in the headlines. Sam Bankman Freed found guilty on all counts and considered the largest case of fraud on record. Major black guy to the crypto king and the cryptocurrency industry. The National Association of Realtors, Keller Williams and Home Services of America also found guilty of colluding to inflate or maintain high commission rates. And right after that, three other real estate firms also got a class action lawsuit. DOJ charges 78 people with $2.5 billion in healthcare fraud affecting elderly and disabled people. So is this the type of wealth you want to create? Possibly good for the short term, but destroying anything that you got going on in the long term. See, here's the thing. During tough times, easy, quick money is so tempting to many people. Now this is where character shows up. But where do you build your character from? What standards, what values and principles are you incorporating in your financial life, in your entrepreneurial journey to make sure you make the right decisions, both for the short term and the long term combined? Well, that's why I find so much wisdom here, not in any business book, but the greatest best-selling book of all time, which is the Bible and more specifically with inside Proverbs and in this series, Ecclesiastes. If you ever wondered why we've been doing this series of Wealth and Wisdom through King Solomon, so be sure to check out all our previous episodes right here. And every week here on Sunday nights, we're going to unpack it on a faith and finance journey to make sure you're building your finances, your entrepreneurial journey, your aspirations to become a first generation cash flow millionaire the right way. King Solomon, at this stage of his life, is looking at a reflective moment in his life. First six, seven chapters, massively reflective, man, quite frankly, it was kind of disappointing to me because the first 31 chapters of Proverbs which is really created and written during his prime, I got so jacked up. Because like, these were like the original mean tweets, like the real wisdom and, and standards you needed to hear from either a father figure or a grandfather. That was Proverbs 1 through 31. And then you're reading Ecclesiastes' first six chapters, and you're, at least I was, sincerely disappointed. Like, what type of loser am I, am I listening to? What, what, was, what happened to the guy in Proverbs? Now, in Ecclesiastes 7 and now 8, these last two chapters, King Solomon now is back to his old form. And I'm excited about it because the things that you want to do to build your life, the type of character, the type of foundation, the solid foundation you want to build your wealth on is actually in these chapters. I mean, you don't want to build your money, your career, your reputation, have, having to look over your shoulder and watch your back, do you? I mean, one of the people we talked to several years ago was the richest mob boss in history, Michael Franchese, okay? If you ever watched The Goodfellas, where the new gangsters come in and next thing he sees all these who's who of the Italian mob boss families. One of those guys was Michael Franchese. Today he's no longer in the life. However, he did serve a prison sentence. His father served a long prison sentence. And today he's a pastor in LA. But he didn't want to live the rest of his life looking over his shoulder. Matter of fact, he's spending the rest of his life now as a pastor and honoring God. Which brings me three key lessons that we can take away here from Ecclesiastes chapter eight. Number one, Respect authority, but also understand its limits. Let's read here in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 2 through 5. It goes like this. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say no to him? What are you doing? Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by misery. So this is a very tough pill to swallow, especially what's going on with the social justice uh, initiatives and, and, and awareness what's going on in the world these days. But there's also a blessing to respecting authority. But there's also a blessing to understand when authority is overstepping its bounds and imposing upon your freedoms. It also implies that there's a time for everything. Have you heard that before? Time for war, time for peace, time for living, time for dying, time for planting, time for harvesting. You've seen this before in Ecclesiastes. Well, he's also imposing once again, there's a time for everything that's going on in your journey to be retired earlier than later in your life, to be financially free, to be debt free, to build your business. There's a timing for everything. And sometimes in our haste, sometimes in our ambition, sometimes in our desire to compete, we end up cutting corners. We don't listen to the rules. 
We don't listen to the regulators. We listen to the laws that are set before us to make sure we are on the straight and narrow path to not just hurt ourselves, but more important, don't hurt other people in your journey. Bottom line, for the aspiring millionaire, this means respecting the rules of business and those in positions of power, but also recognizing when it's time to innovate, disrupt, or pivot. For example, I happen to be in the insurance industry. We haven't been happy with the diversity or the inclusion that was going on with who is getting help in our community for many, many, many generations. I mean, when I first started my career 24 years ago, going on 25 years ago, it was 1999. I was 24, 25 years old. I was disappointed and upset why certain financial education, financial literacy was not taught to me at the beginning of my career. I mean, I was 18, 19, 20 years old, but the first time in my entire life, I had a full-time job. For the first time in my entire life, I was debt-free. For the first time in my entire life, I actually had some money in the bank. But guess what happened? When we taught me values, when we taught me principles, or they said, hey man, let's go drink on the weekends. Hey man, let's go buy, let's go buy everything we can at the BX was based on your paycheck. Let's go buy all the CDs and all the clothes and everything that the base has to offer. Let's go buy things because when you wear things, it shows how influential you are, how rich you are, how successful you are. And what I realized here, listen to King Solomon, that's all meaningless. Back to this point here. If you're in an industry, I got recruited into the insurance industry. The lack of a diversity, the lack of awareness of what's going on with money causes many people to be higher in debt, lower credit score, which means you charge higher interests. Next thing you know, we're enslaved to other things from an economic standpoint that we can't even get out of. So respect authority, respect the laws that allow you to borrow money, but also respect the fact that you gotta pay this money back instead of expecting somebody else to pay back for you. These are some simple things that a lot of people are trying to tell you, hey, don't follow those laws, don't do these things. Next thing you know, you're breaking the law and you find yourself in back to square one because you did break the law, like Sam Bankman Free broke the law. And guess what, now he's facing 100 years in prison. Or you end up in business with the wrong person because they weren't listening to the laws, but you're in business together with them. And guess what? You're held accountable for your business partnership with the partner that you brought in. You may have been following the rules, but they weren't following the rules. You may have respected the authority as your business partner, but now you have to understand when to hit, hit the brakes, adapt, fire, terminate, and start anew. So therefore you stay on a straight and narrow path because if you find yourself in a type of situation, sure, in the short term, it might pay off successfully, but in the long term, there's a price to pay. In John Maxwell's Leadership Bible, he's got a great outline here about the role of a leader and the role of a follower. Let's take a look at this. The role of the follower. Number one, submit to God-given authority. Number two, trust God to accomplish his purpose. Number three, don't quit or become divisive. Now here's the role of the leader. Number one, exercise authority with wisdom and caution. Number two, recognize that no human controls all of life. Number three, lead others by serving, not bossing them. Now some of you are looking at that, wait a minute, this kind of reflects me. By the way, I was a bad boss and I'm still learning how to be a good boss. I'm still learning how to become a better leader. I think that's why we're all doing these episodes. So therefore, a part of me creating this content is also to be focused on things I can improve on and in me focusing on what I can improve on, I can help others who watch a YouTube channel do the same. There's nobody perfect here. I'm definitely not perfect. I'm still evolving. I'm still growing. But I want to know, my children to know that are watching these videos down the road, my grandchildren know watching these videos down the road, that granddaddy Matt and daddy Matt was doing his best to do the right thing. That's my way of adapting, adjusting, and pivoting for the right causes. Number two, second gem in Ecclesiastes chapter eight. Life is unpredictable. Let's read what he says here in Ecclesiastes chapter eight, verse seven through eight. It goes like this. Since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? As no one has power over the wind to contain it. So no one has power over the time of their death. As no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. One more time. So if there's so much unpredictability, that's why even more so the decisions you make have to be based on standards, values, and principles that have lasted the test of time. One of the most dangerous things, one of the most unpredictable things that you can invest in is invest in this phrase, I'm gonna do me. You know why? Doing you probably is not the best thing to follow because you are now, congratulations, in uncharted territory. If you're walking into uncharted territory without any guidance, without anybody to help, without any lifelines to call upon, guess what? Doing me is gonna end you up in a lot of pitfalls. And trust me, I've been through a divorce, I've been through a bankruptcy, I've been through family court, because I'm gonna do me. I followed that rule, and guess what it got me? Lots of grief, lots of pain. I spent the entire 30s of my life repaying back the mistakes of my 20s had somebody told me that life is unpredictable. And to find things that I can predict upon, my life would be so much easier. So. How does this relate also to finance? 
In my forthcoming book called Gotcha, I share the story of one of my favorite clients, my mother. That's right, my mother. My client for the last 21 years. And guess what? Due to unpredictability of the stock market, due to unpredictability of the economy, my mother has not been exposed to unpredictable losses, meaning that my mother has not lost any money for the last 21 going on 22 years. Here's why. King Solomon says, well, if life is unpredictable, focus on what you can focus on, which is predictable. So what do we do? We incorporate life insurance retirement plans, we incorporate Roth IRAs, we incorporate index annuities and fixed income annuities. So therefore my mother, the last 21 years, 22 years, has not only lost a dime, she has not lost a dime in the, in the, in the market, in her retirement savings, even though in the great recession, the pandemic, the craziness that's going on in the world, my mother's been able to thrive during tough times. Why? Because we focused on what we can count on and predict upon. Life insurance helps us predict income. Life insurance is the only financial vehicle that can guarantee the decision you want to make for your family long after you're gone, that will still happen. So therefore, the other aspect is we discuss long-term care insurance because eventually you know that father time, mother time will take over and bodies will start breaking down. And being able to be helped around the house is more of a necessity than, and I wish I would have somebody help me around. So therefore, my father kept falling at the house. So we moved him down here to Dallas, incorporated the benefits of the long-term care insurance policy and instead of digging deeper into their pockets, $6,000, $7,000 a month for, for health care and for a place to stay, guess what happens? The long-term care insurance policies, the predictability of not losing money in the last 21 years in the market has not helped them out. When I went to go speak at the retirement community a couple of Mondays ago, everybody in there was worried and concerned about one thing, inflation. Everybody was concerned about four or $500 of increase on a monthly basis to that retirement community. And guess what my mom and dad were not focused on? That unpredictability. Because they were focused on what they can control was making sure their income comes into them for the rest of their life. They know to cut their expenses, to reduce any waste that's going on in their, in their budget. And now they have smiles on their faces. They're excited about life. They're fired up in this golden years and golden chapter. I think my father's now 82, 83 years old. My mother's 77. Don't look like it. You know why? Because of planning and focusing on what we can control remove stress from their life. And I hope with this teaching here from King Solomon, it can relieve a lot of stress from you too. Number three, King Solomon says here in Ecclesiastes chapter eight, if you're going to pursue, <laughs> don't pursue your success, don't pursue your girl, guy, don't pursue none of that. You know what he says to pursue? He says to pursue wisdom and understanding. Here's what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter eight, verse 12 to 13, it reads like this. Although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know that it will go better with those who fear God and who are reverent before him. Yet, because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. It is a quick reminder that these attributes be incorporated into your life. Integrity, ethics, morality, and wisdom in decision-making are more rewarding than quick, unscrupulous gains. Before I wrap up, I got one last thought as I read Ecclesiastes chapter eight. It's this situation that's often bothered me. Why do good things happen to bad people? Why do good people experience bad things? It says right here in Ecclesiastes, let's take a look at what he says here in the next couple of verses. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too I say is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life because there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of their life God has given them under the sun. So, in my 24 or 25 years of doing business, in my 28, going on 29 years of being a dad, a lot of things will go wrong. Things will go bad. You'll lose money. You'll end up burning a lot of, sadly, minimize those relationships that keep you from getting ahead and you got to ask them for forgiveness. I've asked for people that I've crossed and done wrong and, and, and may have offended in my life. The first thing I went when I started achieving some level of success is say, you know what? I've crossed somebody. And before I achieve the next level of success in my life, I got to go back to that person, him or her, or a bill I needed to pay. I remember, I remember saying to myself, if I'm going to buy my first house, I'm going to go and make sure I pay off all my debt. Everything is paid off in collections. If I'm going to move forward in this relationship, I have to ask forgiveness from the people I've wronged in my past. And it's a very humbling moment. But guess what happened the very next moment? 
That pressure, that stress was relieved for me. The pressure, more importantly, this pressure and stress relieved from that person. And a lot of blessings after that started coming my way. I remember telling myself at this moment, I will never ever borrow money from somebody else ever again. Because early in my life, I borrowed money from people and without ever having the intention of paying them back, I, please don't judge me. I was a money dumb guy before I was a money smart guy. But guess what started happening when, when people called on me or bill collectors called me because I was behind on my bills. I had a foreign credit score, worst, one of the worst credit scores you can ever have. In my journey of starting to live a better life, I had to call those bill collectors. I had to call those credit card companies. I had to face my credit report and say, I need to get these things straight. I need to manage my money better coming in. I need to make sure that I don't blame my career, my boss, my business for the money I didn't have. I'd be a better steward and be more wise with the skills I was able to obtain and utilize in my business. And after that aspect, after I started practicing that, it wasn't just one of these things I read in the Bible, it became a real thing. And I don't wanna live the rest of my life, nor my children to live the rest of their life, having to worry about looking over their shoulder or paying for daddy's sins. And so when you're looking at your business, when you're looking at your aspirations, your goals, what are some things that you need to ask somebody to forgive you for? What are those things on your credit port that are still stinging you? Uh, the, an AT&T bill, or maybe a landlord that you didn't pay back rent, you think you're just gonna get away with it. Yeah, you might get away with it in the short term, but in the long-term aspects, you know some of the things you've done wrong. I want you to hopefully consider living a clean slate. A clean beginning means that you've rectified things in the past. And along the way, guess what's gonna start happening? You're going to enjoy life. You're not at where you wanna be? No problem, enjoy life. You didn't win this competition in business. You didn't win this competition, uh, again, in the, the bid. And you chose somebody else. Get better. Improve. Don't get bitter. Get better. Find ways to increase your skill set. So, therefore...